I want you to know today that Jesus can heal our sicknesses. Ask yourself, so you're certain, is it important to be specific? That big word again, specificity. God is a God of specificity. When Jesus stood in front of the stone that had been rolled away, he spoke a small number of words, but it was specific. We need to know today, what is it that is troubling you? Is it a new illness? Is it an old illness? You went for a doctor's checkup and you were fine, or you, so you thought. And now the doctor says, oh, but you just have three months to live. Things can change suddenly. Perhaps it's a relationship today that needs a resurrection touch from heaven because we're not here, church, just to seek healing in the realm of the natural. Oh, no, God is so much more a sophisticated genius of a God than He will just heal our bodies and leave our minds broken, that He would heal our bodies and leave us with a broken spirit or a fractured soul. No, God is a God of the resurrection. When He brought Lazarus back, He brought all of him back. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is good. There's healing in the house today. I'd like to ask you to stand with me, if you would, to your feet for the reading of God's Word. I'd also like to take a moment as I look into the camera and welcome those of you joining us from wherever you might be. We know and heard this week, we want to welcome our international intercessors that pray for people's needs in this house, in our church, as we pray for you and your needs all over the world. We want to welcome you today, pastors and ministers in apostolic relationship with us, watching this word today. May it bless you by the power and spirit of God in Jesus' name. I'd like to read to you today from God's word as we stand. It'll come up on the screen. It is found in Isaiah. We Brits say Isaiah. I think you say Isaiah. So it is not two people. He was not schizophrenic. You might be wondering if I am. But we do say Isaiah, so please forgive me for that. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 in the NIV. He prophesies into existence these incredible words. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Heavenly Father, as we come to this sacred time of communion and healing before you. We thank you for your presence in this house. For you have declared through your word that we should forsake not the assembling and the gathering and the coming together of your sons and daughters. And as we do, Lord, we're ever mindful that without you, we can do nothing. But knowing that your presence is here, suddenly all things become possible. Father, use this vessel of clay today, your servant, to speak your word. Let your children's hearts be open. Let them realize, Father, that anything is possible today. That we may have come in here one way, but we can leave another healed, changed, forever, something shifting in the realm of the unseen by the power of the unseen, in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, family, as you take your seats. The Holy Spirit, as Bishop mentioned a minute ago, we aptly named this a communion healing service. And I'm going to minister the Word for some 30 or so minutes, and then we're going to take communion together as we would normally do. And we're going to use the communion as a point of contact for healing. And I'm saying that so you can begin to prepare your heart. I love coming to church. And I know that you do too. And I know it's not a religious exercise for you and I. It's a relational exercise. We come because we want to worship the God who created us. We come because, yes, we want to see each other's smiling faces, and we want to hug each other as brothers and sisters in the faith. 
but we come to gather because we serve a living God. So be expectant today as you hear the word, for God declares that signs and wonders will follow the preaching of his word. So yes, I may preach, I may spit a little. It's very concerning for me that, because I'm not assuming for one minute that it has anything holy to do with it, but I've just noticed as I've got older, I spit more. So Pastor Brian, Pastor Ryan, you just better take cover. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the prophet Isaiah. We know that he lived in Jerusalem, beautiful city, many of you have visited. We also know that he had a huge destiny in God. Part of that destiny was to call God's people, Judah, back to a faithful relationship with the Heavenly Father. They'd strayed a little. I think we can relate to that. We've all strayed a little. And God used Isaiah to speak to them, to prophesy to them over years of ministry. Isaiah was also chosen by God, listen to this, to say more about the coming Messiah, to say more about the redemptive work of Jesus than any other writer in the Old Testament. Now, for me, I find that extraordinary because Isaiah was talking about Jesus more than 700 years before Jesus even walked on this earth. Now, some of us aren't sure where we're going to be this time next month. We might think we'd like to be somewhere like Hawaii or wherever, but Isaiah is talking about Jesus coming to the earth 700 years before it happened. Hmm, absolutely remarkable. History teaches us that Isaiah prophesied and that his ministry was in existence for somewhere between 50 to 60 years. He was, to say the least, a huge influence on his generation. And he prophesied to them by the power of God, as well as to generations that would come after them. And Isaiah, literally, his prophecies speak to you and I today. They speak to us in this year, 2021. And his prophecies are still coming true. I'm just giving him a little bit of street cred here to help us realize this just wasn't any little minor prophet. This wasn't a one-man shop incorporated, a prophet of one that had gone into the church and says, I like to be a prophet. No, this was a man chosen by God to speak prolific prophetic words into history so you and I could build our very Christian faith upon the patterns and principles that he spoke. And so he speaks into existence these words. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. To me, church, this prophecy, it, it just contains so much revelation that, that we have to dig a little deeper. We have to look at what it means. We have to look a little below the surface to understand exactly what he was prophesying. Now, historically, in the times of the patriarchs, wells were very important. In fact, they're referenced almost right throughout Scripture. And they were vital part of everyday life. Abraham had wells. Isaac had wells. Jacob had wells. Now Joseph, you may know the story, Joseph had a bad experience with wells. The Bible tells us that he was actually put down a well. And then he was pulled back up out the well and then he was sold as a slave. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I'd keep away from the well. Jeremiah was put in a well and imprisoned there for some time. Moses had wells. In fact, Moses met his future wife, Zipporah, at a well. Even his name, Moses, means drawn from the water. And if you visited Israel, maybe you visited, like I did, Abraham's well. It's still a place you can go to today. Abraham's well 
in the old city of Bathsheba. It's a popular tourist attraction. What fascinated me about it was how big it was. It is, in fact, nearly 13 feet in diameter and 44 feet deep. And they were serious about building the wells. The last 16 feet of Abraham's well is dug out of solid rock. So wells were very serious places. History teaches us that it may have been from this very place, the well of Abraham, that Abraham journeyed with Isaac to Mount Moriah to offer him as a sacrifice unto God. Wells were absolutely critical to life. They were also important landmarks. So if you had a topographic map of ancient Palestine, you would see wells marked on such a map. And the location of these wells actually determined how travel would be undertaken. You see, today when you and I get on a plane, we don't have a chart. We leave all that to the captain. We assume he's done this before. At least we hope he has. <laughs> it's never a good thing when he comes over and says, hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. If this is your first flight today, be comforted. It's mine also. <laughs> the location of wells were critical to taking a journey. In those days, if you were going on a journey, you would gather your crew. It was called a caravan. And you would transit from place A to place B. And you have to remember, this whole land is a desert. Canaan land, which the Bible refers to, later became known as Palestine, was and still is a very, 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 very hot place to live. Bishop, you've been there. Most tourists today will try and avoid going there in the summer months because it's simply so hot. So knowing where these wells were located was literally a matter of life or death. You have to understand that these wells contained life-sustaining water, not just for the people in the caravan, but also for their livestock. So if the caravan was delayed in their journey, which could happen, maybe they had a confrontation with an enemy tribe, or perhaps it was just bad weather. Well, I didn't know it rained in the desert. Don't worry about the rain. You gotta watch out for sandstorms in the desert. I've been in one. And if you haven't, just watch the mummy. <laughs> a sandstorm stops everything. So whatever the reason was, if they failed to reach a certain place at a certain time and didn't get to the well in time, their animals could perish, which would simply mean no food. Imagine, if you will, for a moment that you were on one of these journeys. Travel with me in your imagination. <coughs> You're on a journey from a certain town to another town, and you're crossing a desert, a dry, hot, sandy plain with relentless heat. Your spouse is with you. Your children are with you. Your in-laws are with you. Everybody in the world that you care about is with you. Even your favorite sheep, Dolly, is with you. Now, Dolly is important. Let's talk about Dolly for a second. Dolly is important because you have great plans for Dolly. You see, when you look at Dolly, you see in her future a great lamb curry. So you've got to keep Dolly alive. You've got to keep Dolly fed. You've got to keep Dolly watered. So you've got to get Dolly to the well. But yet the journey just seems so long. It feels like it's getting hotter and hotter and the food supplies are getting less and less and the water skins are running on empty. But all you can see is sand. But you keep going because you have a map and the map tells you that the town you're looking for called Elam is getting closer. And suddenly on the horizon, like a mirage, you see some palm trees 
And you say to yourselves, could this be the town? Could this be the town? Could this be the Elam? We're looking for the place of large trees. The very place, Bible tells us, that our ancestors, the Israelites, rested and stopped and refreshed after leaving Egypt. As you get closer, you see the large palm trees swaying in the wind. And yes, there in the middle of the trees is a well. And you start to get excited. And just like the children of Israel in the book of Numbers, you begin to sing the song they made so famous, Spring up, O well! And you begin to rejoice and you begin to clap your hands and you begin to sing and you begin to praise God because now there is a well from which you can draw refreshing water, life-sustaining water, water for the family, water for the in-laws, water for Dolly the sheep, water for everyone. Because there is a well. You see, church, to the patriarchs, the place of the well became the place of God's provision. To the patriarchs, the water from the well spoke of God's favor over their lives. So here we are today, in June of 2021. And you and I, church, we're on a journey as well. We're on the journey of our destiny. We're on the journey of our purpose, referred to in Scripture as the holy plan of God for our lives. You and I are on a journey. And there are times when the journey we're on can be like going through a desert. There are times places can be dry and there's no water. There are times the brass, the heavens feel like they've turned into brass and as if we no longer hear the voice of God and there is no cloud to follow or a pillar of fire and there's no signs, there's no wonders, there's no miracles, there's no wells. But yet Isaiah's prophecy is true when he said that you and I should with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. So we must ask ourselves today, where are these wells of salvation in my life? You owe it to you to ask yourself, where are the wells of salvation? This water that Isaiah spoke about, this water that seems so refreshing, where is it? How do we find them? And how do we draw from them? Oh, and let me tell you, Isaiah was very specific in his words. He does not say, you shall draw water from the well of salvation. Isaiah says, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Wells as in many, not just singular as in one, not just one as in singular, but wells as in many. We have to realize today, church, there is not just one well that we can draw from, but there are many wells, praise God, many wells. Knowing where these wells are, Knowing how we find them in the journey that we are on is critical. Let me tell you very quickly about a very powerful story. Oh, and I love this story, Bishop, so much. It's found in John chapter 4. You may know this story. It talks about a certain Samaritan woman. And this woman, bless her heart, she meets up with Jesus. Jesus. And she strikes up a conversation with him, which in and of itself seemed odd to her because she was different. She was not Jewish, and it was not customary in the day for a man to speak to a woman such as her. But yet Jesus engages her, and after talking with him, she makes this remarkable discovery. She discovers that she's talking to the Messiah, She gets so excited. The Bible doesn't tell us whether she does a skipping and a dance or a shout or whatever she does or what Samaritan woman did in those days, but the Bible tells us that she runs back to her village and she gathers all her friends who are also Samaritans and they return to hear the words of Jesus. 
And after Jesus has spoken to this crowd of Samaritans, men and women, boys and girls, this is what they say to the woman. Her friends say to her, and it's recorded in John 4, 42, they say it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Oh, church, you have to realize that this was not a chance meeting. This did not just happen in the town square. This did not just happen anywhere. This happened at a well. And this was not just any old well, because there were many. This happened at Jacob's well. Ah, oh, who's Jacob? Well, if you don't know, he's got some street cred all for himself. Jacob can claim Abraham as his grandfather. So I don't know who your grandfather is. Maybe he's a big wig. Maybe he's a big daddy. Maybe he's got some street cred. Maybe he's done some famous stuff. But I tell you what, it goes, it, you've got to go a long way to beat it when someone can tell you my big daddy was Abraham. This was at Jacob's well. And this is more than significant. It's seriously significant. Because church, this is the place. You have to understand what happened. This is the place where Jesus offered salvation to those of mixed Jewish and Gentile descent. You see, Samaritans, they were half Jewish and half Gentile. And they were hated by people all across the land. They were ostracized because they were a mixed race. Does it sound familiar? They were looked down upon because they were different. What does Jesus do? Jesus offers salvation to all at the well of Jacob. He says, Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, all races, all ethnicities, the kingdom of God is available to you. At the well of Jacob, Jesus literally deals with the issue of racism once and for all, thousands of years ago. He trashed all kinds of religious predispositions and theologies and prejudices. And he invited the Samaritans, the ones of the day who were hated and reviled and spat upon, that men would not even talk to women around the well because they were Samaritans. I tell you today and I declare to you today and in the atmosphere of this church and to everybody's watching, you can send in some sample to some genealogy company anywhere you like and to Jesus. It doesn't matter if when it comes back, you are a mix of 100 races. The kingdom of God is available to you. The kingdom of God is open for you. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this happened at the well of Jacob, the grandson of the father of our faith. Oh, to this day, we should forever be grateful for what Jesus did. What began with the Samaritan woman who came simply to draw water from the well and met Jesus who would give her a different kind of water. For it was also at this very place, Jacob's well, Jesus spoke into existence the words in John 4, 14, when he said, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. For the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The kind of water that Jesus gives us, church, the kind of water that Jesus offers you today leads to eternal life. Oh, and yet there's some more history that we should look at when it comes to Jacob's well. Why stop here? Why stop now? No, there's something even more interesting, uh, greatly interesting, is the location of Jacob's well. It is indeed located 
in one of the most hotly contested, fought over, divided and conquered regions in all of Israel, and in fact, the whole world. This piece of land where this well is situated has been fought over for centuries. And after the first church, the Christian church, built a church, they literally placed it directly over the well. If this glass for a minute was Jacob's well, they, didn't, they built the church, bang, right on top of it. And then shortly after that, an invading army, there was lots of them, the Ottomans, these mans and these womans and these Ottos and this army and that army, the Byzantines, the Hutines, the Wattines, the whoever times, they came and they destroyed the city. They burned down the houses, they destroyed everything, and they burned down the church that was built over the well. But something extraordinary happened after they did this. Once they had got occupation of this land, the conquering army built their church over the well. And then lo and behold, the next invading army came because did I mention, this is a hotly fought over piece of land. It is valuable to so many in different faiths, in different religions, in different cultures, that there was constant war. So the next invading army comes, destroys the church, and they say to themselves, let's build a temple over the well. They don't build it to the left of the well. They don't build it to the right of the well. They don't build it down the street next to the city square. They don't build it up the street next to town hall. They build it directly over the well. And lo and behold, this happens again and again and again and again. And every single time this is destroyed, they build a well, a church again over the well. And all through these invasions, the well itself is never damaged. All through these invasions and conquering by invading forces, the well stays intact. And what's amazing for me is I thoroughly believe that, that these guys, perhaps they didn't know as to why they were doing what they were doing, but yet they knew they had to do it. And right up until this day, you have to hear this, right up until this day, in June of 2021, there is a church that stands directly over Jacob's well in the West Bank of Jerusalem. What was going on here? I'll tell you what was going on. God was speaking to you and I through history. Well, does he do that? Well, think about it. Even the word history just means his story. The whole world and everything within it is about God's story. It's his story. The world and the earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord, belongs to God. He created it. The earth is his footstool. Everything is God's. Yes, he speaks to us through history. And God was revealing something so powerful. And God was saying something so clear for the church and for the world to establish in their minds and in their hearts and in their souls. God was saying loud and clear that one of the places the wells of salvation will forever and always be found is in the church. Is in the church. No matter the persecution, enemies can come tomorrow and knock the building down. It will be rebuilt. Enemies can come tomorrow and persecute the church. It will stand. No matter what people are saying about us, no matter what people are saying about you, the church is one of the places the wells of salvation dwell and can be found. And so I say to you today with confidence, that right here, right here today, the wells of salvation are open and available to you and I. The church is and always will be one of the custodians of the wells of salvation. 
History teaches us that. The patriarchs teaches us that. It was no chance meeting that Jesus was sitting on the rim of Jacob's well to bust open racism once and for all and to deal with it forever and eternally through the church and through the kingdom of God while sitting on one of the wells of salvation. Let me declare to you today that the church, the local church, is anointed and chosen and created by God to build His kingdom here on this earth. God has chosen the church. This is plan A. He does not have a plan B. So this is the A team, the A plus. Everything is good about it. A is always good. Plus is always better. Everything about the plan is God's plan. The local church is the weapon, is the force, is the anointed one, is the chosen one to build his kingdom on this earth. I believe fully that God chose the church and God does not make mistakes. You and I are a part of that church. The Bible tells us we are a part of the body of Christ. You are not the whole body of Christ. That's why you need to be in the church to make the body whole. Every now and then in my journeys, I come across somebody who says, I don't need to go to church. And I think to myself, but God says you are part of the body. You're not the whole body. If you were the whole body and you had everything, then you're right. You don't need to go to church. And they come up with these interesting little quirks. Well, you can put a wheelbarrow in a garage and it doesn't make it a car. Yeah. And they had to get a degree to get to that place. <laughs> Listen to me. You and I are part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. Not just the finger, not just the arm, not just the foot or the ear. If you're running around out there all by yourself, all on a little island. Come on now. Listen to me. There will always be something unique and something beautiful when we assemble together. And there will always be something blessed and anointed when we worship together. Amen. And when we are here in a place like this, we can do exactly what Isaiah told us to do. We can prepare our hearts to be able to draw from the wells of salvation. Because together, Hear me, brethren, sisters, we are the body of Christ. Together, there are apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists and workers of miracles and workers of healings and gifts of administration and gifts of service and gifts of giving. When we are together under the authority of the one who is the under-shepherd of this house, the bishop of this house, there is a bishopric mantle that rests over this place. When we are together, we stand as the body of Christ. Don't be a wheelbarrow in a garage. Today, you and I, because we are together, we can draw refreshing, life-sustaining power right here in the local church from the wells of salvation. Together, today, because we are together, and together we are the body of Christ, we can draw wisdom and revelation right here in the local church from the wells of salvation. Today, 
because we are together and we are the body of Christ, we can draw on apostolic leadership and prophetic insight right here in the local church from the wells of salvation. And today, you and I, as the body of Christ, can draw guidance and direction about your purpose in God, about the holy plan of God for your life, right here in the local church from the wells of salvation. Today, you can draw healings, miracles, signs, and wonders right here in the local church from the wells of salvation because we have to realize it is not natural water that these wells contain, but it's supernatural, and it's all because of God. It's all because of God. That's why it's so critical to stay connected, to belong, to be involved, to be a part of something that is bigger than yourself, where the wells of salvation can be found. Let me bring this to a conclusion today as we prepare for communion. Your destiny your purpose in God, no matter where it takes you. Listen to me, my dear brother. Listen to me, my dear sister. Those of you watching online, your destiny, your purpose in God, no matter where it takes you, will always be connected to a local church. God has empowered the church to raise up disciples of Christ to continue the Lord's work and to build the kingdom of God on this earth. God has not called you to be a lone ranger, an island unto yourself, an apostle of one. God has called you to be joined, to be connected, to be in relationship under the protection of seasoned spiritual leaders. If you are a one-man band, you need to give up your band and come and join the church. You need to link arms with spiritual powerhouses that will stand with you, defend you, intercede for you, and believe with you for miracles, signs, and wonders in Jesus' mighty name. We will always and forever be stronger together. We will always and forever be stronger and united in prayer. Our faith will be greater where one will chase a thousand, but two will put 10,000 to flight and a cord of three is not easily broken. We need each other to stand with each other, to stand together as the church and overcome every attack from the enemy. Let me quickly just talk about the other place where you will find the wells of salvation. I can prove this to you from Scripture. The God has predestined. That means He has already put in place ahead of time wells of salvation for you to draw from, to draw out of, along the route of your journey of destiny. It's predestined. God, God's appointed pathway for your life, you will find many wells of salvation. And that's why you need to be, and I need to be, walking exactly in the pathway that God has chosen for us. That's why you and I need to be doing exactly that thing that God has assigned for us. So if it's a deacon, then you need to deacon. And if it's an usher, you need to usher. And if you're an evangelist, you need to be evangelizing. And if you're an apostle, you need to be apostling or prophetize, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. Because when you're doing that, there's going to be wells of salvation open to you. The alternative church is not something I sense the Holy Spirit wanting me to focus on today. But the alternative is arid seasons. 
seasons where there's no fruit on the tree. It's the season for the fruit, but there's no fruit. It's the season for the harvest, but the harvest fields are bare. Because somehow, some way, at some time, you did something far worse than sin before God. You did something far worse than sin against your wife or your husband or your children. You did something far more devastating to the plan of God for your life than what sin will do. You got distracted. You took your eye off the ball. You went down a pathway, a rabbit hole that God never predestined for you. And the wells are shut. Not only are they shut, you can't even find them. You become like a blind man in a dark house searching for a black cat that doesn't exist. It's an impossible journey where there is no provision, no help, no people, no money. Because you got distracted. Let me prophesy for a moment. There's somebody watching today. You're a pastor. Listen to me. The Lord says you are a seasoned man of God. You have been doing what you have been doing for a long time. And the Lord says to you this morning, my son, be careful. He says the devil's strategy against you is to distract you. But the Lord's word for you this morning is that you are to keep your eyes like a laser focused on that which he has set before you. For the Holy Spirit says, my son, I called you, I chose you to feed my sheep, to tend to my sheep. But yet there is a pathway that is open to you that is nothing but a distraction. It is a place you want to walk down to. It is a place you intend to walk down to. But the Lord says to you this morning, my son, stop. Take hold of your moment in time. Stay with what God gave you. Hold fast within your hands and the authority to which God has endued upon your hands and the apostolic voice that he has raised you up to be. Stay with what he blessed you to prosper in, saith the Lord. The Holy Spirit is saying, we're not talking about sin, my son. We're talking distraction. And church, hear me today. Often the distraction is something we want to do. It's something we like to do. It's something that we find energy in, enthusiasm in, maybe even something that sets my soul on fire. What the Bible calls good works. But the works for which God is interested in is not the good works, but His works the works for which he created you, the works for which he gave you gifts and talents and anointings and callings. And it's when you are about those works that the wells of salvation will be open, that you will find the wells of salvation and you will be able to reach into them and you will be positioned by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can draw the provision, the power, the people, the purpose, the plan, and everything you need to live the holy plan of God for your lives. We need to be in the right place. Oh, hallelujah. Gracious God. Gracious God. Gracious God. Well, we're going to have communion at this time. So what's going to happen now, family, is uh, I believe Elder Gina is going to come as a psalmist and minister to us in song. 
as that is happening, if Pastor Brian and the pastors would come, and they will, you can stay seated, they will distribute communion. And I want you to know that we're going to move into a time after you receive the emblems. Do not open the emblems, please. Do not take the emblems. Just hold them in your hand because we're going to trust God that He will visit us and allow us to draw signs, wonders, and miracles from the wells of salvation in Jesus' name.